spanning the nerd world and feeding your fandom. Crash landed. From comics to video games. From the cinematic universe to television. Earth. Connecting you to the biggest stars in the industry. Something out there had discovered us. It's time for the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Here's your host, James Witham. Want to find out what's next this fall for TV? Yeah, you come to the right place. It's episode 336 of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. I'm James Witham, and as far as Fox is concerned, we've got you covered. This week, a double dose of Fox fall TV interviews for you. First of all, we're going to have Ryan McPartland joining me this week to talk about L.A.'s finest, ah, the Mr. District Attorney himself. Maybe we'll try and get some secrets out of him about the secrets that his wife actually has on the series. Also this week, going to talk about Next, which is coming to Fox on October the 6th. If you haven't seen it already, it's it's going to really freak you out, I can tell you that right now. As a matter of fact, we'll get into that with showrunner Manny Cotto coming up here in just a few minutes, plus a ton of great nerd news. I mean, Miss Marvel has been cast. We'll talk about that. Some excellent new comics to talk about this week and a great new sponsor as well. It's October. Halloween's right around the corner. So, of course, Shudder is our sponsor this week. If you're looking for your horror fix, a great place to get that. I'll tell you about that a little bit later on. But right now, Got to talk about L.A.'s finest. Ryan McPartland joins me next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hi, this is Keiko Agena from Fox's Prodigal Son, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. So, you know, I thought we could use a little bit more law and order on the show this week. Well, I've been digging L.A.'s finest so much. I thought, why not bring the district attorney himself on the show this week? There's no other way to describe this guy other than that he's awesome. It's Ryan McPartland. How you doing, man? Good, brother. How you doing? Doing great, man. Doing great. Now, we've actually gotten to see Nancy's big personality on display in the first couple episodes of the show and the broadcast premiere anyway. But as far as the broadcast premiere is concerned, I feel like we're still kind of getting to know Patrick a little bit. So how would you describe him? Well, I think Patrick is just a solid dude. He's always known his moral compass of what is right and what is wrong and always been able to choose the right path. What's interesting, I think the audience will be able to see this season that as he becomes the interim DA for Los Angeles, he ends up, you know, compromising a couple values for the greater good. We see it all the time with politicians. And as I kind of learned, district attorney is it's an elected office. So you're law enforcement and you are, you know, you're a politician of sorts. Being the acting district attorney coming up in some of these upcoming episodes, can we actually see Patrick get a little bit more involved in some of the cases that Sid and Nancy are working on. And then we saw maybe a touch of that in the second episode. Will we see more coming up? Absolutely. When I started on the show, you know, the original pilot, they had Patrick as a doctor. And they quickly pivoted when uh, we went on Spectrum first, on Spectrum On Demand, to make him a district attorney or interim district attorney so that there's a lot more room for us to kind of conflict with each other and create more story. So you're going to see us really, you know, digging into each other's past. And it's it's not everything that, I'll say it's not all wine and roses. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, no doubt about that. As a matter of fact, I was just going to get to that because we know Nancy's hiding some pretty big stuff from Patrick, actually. And we saw how Sid reacted when she found out. So how do you think Patrick will react? And how much could that actually, that reaction change maybe if Nancy just comes clean with him? You know, that's always the interesting part when you're watching these uh, shows is sometimes you're just like, hey, man, just tell him about your past. Just right. come clean. But there are certain things, you know, there are certain things that you just you can't do because because it'll compromise and unravel the, the whole sweater for somebody else's life. So that, that's what's tough. And I think that's where the writers did a really good job is saying, hey, you know, let's make this story complex. Let's make it so that it's not that easy for Nancy to come clean about her past with Patrick. Although that he seems like the type of guy that would be accepting and forgiving. There's some things that, you know, he probably would say, this is not the person that I first fell in love with. Right. Can I get to know, can I get to know you now and accept all of the things that you've done in the past to get to where you're at? Even if it was for the good of family, even if it was for the good of somebody else, whoever it might have been for, 
can I accept that and can we move forward? And how dirty is he willing to get his hand to protect family? I'll tell you one thing that really perked my eyebrows up was when we saw Dante show up at the McKenna house in the second episode. And of course, you know, Patrick had no idea who he was, invited him inside, all kinds of stuff. So having Dante show up is one thing. But having him in the house to me seems a little next level, especially, you know, with his daughter there and everything. So how do you feel like his and Nancy's relationship can recover from that? Well, I'll tell you what. I think that there's not many actors that can necessarily pull that off in a in a rational way. But our writers know that I'm the type of guy that will just invite anybody into the house. Oh, totally. Yeah. And, and we'll be... And we'll be able to sell the audience and just saying, oh, yeah, come on in. Let's let's have a beer. You, the game's on. You want to watch the game? <laughs> and whatever it might be, that that is, that is, I think, one of my strong suits is just welcoming people with open arms. So I've, I found that, you know, very interesting that the that our writers were able to tap into the personalities of each actor in the different ways. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I don't want to give anything away for future episodes, but it's definitely going to come back in some exciting ways, you know, for the audience to be able to go, okay, how is this going to play out? This guy's, he's not here just to say hi to Nancy. He's here Mm -hmm. for a purpose. And how is that going to affect Uh, Patrick and Nancy's relationship. Now, speaking of Izzy, we know that she doesn't really get along with Nancy a whole lot. Maybe that's just teenage angst or something like that. But talk about Patrick's relationship with his daughter and how he deals with that friction between the two of them. Well, you'll come to find out that, you know, Izzy's mom passed away. And I don't think, I don't think, you know, when you go through loss like that, to accept anybody new as a, as a role model in your life, as an authority figure, is a tough thing. But, you know, Izzy especially is going through these these changes in life and watching two people kind of go through their own conflicts when she's having her own turmoil. You know, that own, the, that own teenage angst, you know, trying to find herself, trying to come to terms with what you know, her past is and the loss that she's experienced. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's an interesting dynamic. I don't have a teenage daughter. I have a teenage son and those, uh, puberty hormones are real (laughs) and they are, they're all over the place and I'm always negotiating with them until I just, I've come up with this voice that I use when I'm just like (laughs) calling him out for the erratic behavior. So uh, it was interesting to be able to do that as a father to a teenage daughter and and tap into those real life scenarios that you just go, OK, we got to negotiate this situation the same way we got to negotiate with with a hostage situation. No sometimes. doubt. So, uh, yeah, there's lawyer skills coming to play. I certainly can understand that. We're talking to Ryan McPartland, of course, plays Patrick McKenna on L.A.'s Finest, which you can watch every Monday night on Fox. Now, Ryan, Sid is, seems like a member of the family. I mean, she's, you know, she's at the house, she's hanging out. It's very, it's very casual kind of thing. And obviously she knows what's going on with Nancy. So what would you say is Patrick's opinion of Sid? And do you think she should actually tell Patrick what's going on? No, I think that it's funny because I talked to some of my friends that, you know, were Navy SEALs and they had a term for the guys they served with. And that was called first family meaning they come before their own family members. So I feel like that's got to be the same when you have your partners back and you're spending that much time. They're truly spending more time with each other than Nancy and Patrick will ever spend together. So if there's any trust broken there, then, you know, their lives are at stake of watching each other's back. So, you know, I think Patrick just knows the deal, knows that, you know, Sid is going to keep any secret of Nancy's from him. And they will come probably, their relationship will always come before mine and Nancy's relationship, especially if she's called out at any hour, you know, like from a function, from our home life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the deal you got to sign up with when you marry a cop like that. It's, it's, you know, you have this entire other family that, and these loyalties and these bonds that you have to negotiate with. And some people probably are not cut out for that. 
Man, that is such a great way to put it. Now, you've been talking about the writers a lot, and they definitely are great. As a matter of fact, when I talked to Brandon Margolis and Brandon Saunier, we talked about Easter eggs from Bad Boys being in the show, and they even talked about how there's going to be a Ghostbusters Easter egg involving Ernie Hudson later on. So, you know, my mind starts to wonder, Ryan, and I can't help but wonder, you know, could we have an awesome Chuck Easter egg in a future episode, maybe? I'm just saying. Well, I know the guys dig Chuck, so... If they put an Easter egg in there and didn't tell me, they they easily could have because, you know, I'm always very aware of how I use the word awesome. It, it's it's mm-hmm. something that I don't throw around lightly as another character. So I don't, I intentionally don't use that word. So if they did, they haven't even told me yet. So it'll be a surprise to me when I watch the episode and go, oh, okay. All right, I see what you did there. <laughs> so they totally could have and not even like, and maybe assume that I'd catch it. But I am on the fifth season of Chuck right now. We have two more episodes to go with my boys. And I have a whole new appreciation for it. I, I can't even tell you how much I love that show and how much, how great it is to watch with kids of a certain age. Myself included, man, a lot of people still love that show. But, of course, loving your work on L.A.'s Finest as well. As a matter of fact, speaking of your past roles, we certainly know that you have a lot of action skills. We've seen that on Chuck and and a couple of other shows as well. So could we see Mr. Uh, Acting District Attorney take the suit jacket off and maybe, you know, throw down a little bit at some point? You know, that's the fun of this role, man. It's I'll say Patrick, when he gets pushed to the edge, he unravels a couple times that you wouldn't necessarily expect it. And I love that they wrote that for me. And I love that I got to play that out because dude, that's real life. You know, you can only take so much before you snap sometimes and before things become physical. And I've done that, you know, in my younger years before I came to my senses, <laughs> I got a couple of scars to show for right it. On, yeah. um, but it's like, it's one of those things that, you know, it's human nature and, you end up like I like to play that out now on on screen, but in real life, I am cool as a cucumber, and I'm like that doesn't you know I'm the wise old man now, right? So I would never I would never throw down if I didn't have to, and use plenty of negotiating skills to get out of a situation. But you know it's still somewhere deep down, and I get to play that out on screen once in a while, and it's fun to do that. I love it, man. I love it. Now, of course, you've you've been in some, you know, Hallmark movies and stuff like that too. I, and I was thinking about, you know, what you were saying about Patrick and Nancy's relationship. So, if if Patrick and Nancy were were in their own Hallmark movie, what do you think they'd call that? What would the title be? You think? Oh man. Well, let's see. It would. So there's always a formula to these, right? Right. So exactly. Either, yeah. have to be, either it's the small town, right? That the girls coming back to the small town, or the guys coming back to the small town. Or they're competing for something. So I think Patrick and Nancy would have to compete for something. And what that would be would have to be uh, something that has to do with a... I'm going to have to think about this one because it would have to be very... It always has to have Christmas in the title. Of course, yeah. It has to show that they're going to have competition. And at the end of the day... You know, she'd fall head over heels in love with me, and How could couldn't she help not? herself, right? And just be, <laughs> just just be whisked away. So I don't know. Let's put that up to the listeners. Come up with some titles and let us know. Oh, I love know, that. And, I love it. Put totally. it out there. Yeah, we're doing that for sure. Now, before I let you go, Ryan, after just two episodes. It seems like, you know, danger's already coming at you guys from all angles. So how intense are things going to get in episode three and going forward this season? Well, what's good is they, you know, they introduce all of our characters very briefly in the first episode or two. But what's great is how, and we had the freedom to do this when, when we adjusted from the original pilot, is they start diving into everybody's backstories. And everybody, every character has their own life and their own existence. And in a short amount of time, we cover a lot of ground. And then they tie it all together. And so the stakes are really high, man. The stakes are really high by the end of the first season for everybody involved. And you get to see this like, okay, what, what are the threads that tie us all together? What are the, the ties that bind? So, um, yeah, I'd stay tuned. And it's going to be an exciting ride. And there's a lot of action. And these guys, you know, they've done a great job. And I'm just glad to be a part of it. 
And you're not going to want to miss any of these episodes, guys. Watch LA's Finest every Monday at 8 o'clock on Fox. Make sure you're watching it again, too. You never know what you might have missed. Watch it again on the Fox app and see what this guy's up to. It's Patrick McKenna himself, Ryan McPartland. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Hey, thank you. So great to talk to Ryan McPartland about LA's Finest, but we're not done with Fox shows yet. We're going to talk to Manny Cotto, the creator of Next, which is also on Fox, and we'll do that next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Patrick Megan. I'm an executive producer at Family Guy, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This fall, there is plenty of great TV to look forward to. This one near the top of my list, though. It's a new series called Next from Fox. I just happen to have the creator and writer of the show right here with me this week. It's Manny Cotto. Manny, how you doing? Great. How are you? I'm doing very well. Now, Manny, when I was watching the series, to me, Next kind of felt like Stephen King's Christine, but in Silicon Valley. And it was so, so cool. So the very concept of the series, though, made me kind of pull all the wires out of my house and my smart devices. It was so freaky. So how did you come up with the idea for this series? Well, you know, it's interesting. It actually started, the nugget of the idea came from an actual real life event. And that is um, my son. I mean, we have like four Alexas in the house. We, We can't get enough of them and my kids love them. And one morning, my son, um, who was nine at the time, woke up and was looking awfully tired before school. Uh, This was in the days when kids actually left the house to go to school. And I said, you know, what's the matter? And and, and he said, well, Alexa started talking to me last night in the middle of the night. I don't know why. And and, and so, you know, we checked and see, did we accidentally set an alarm? Did, Did something weird happen? And we never found out what it was. But, you know, it happened one other time when he was having a sleepover. And, you know, according to him, the Alexa just started talking. Wow. And that stuck in the back of my head when, you know, I think not long later, too much later, I had read a couple of books on the subject of artificial intelligence and books that 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 had just come out. And one of them was being kind of quoted by Elon Musk in kind of an alarmed fashion about how we are getting closer and closer to the development of artificial general intelligence, which means an AI that can think like a person in a general sense, not an AI that's, you know, the AIs that we have right now that can drive our cars and, and you know, play computer games and things like that are very narrow AI. But a right. general AI is an AI that can function. And the, the, these books postulated, you know, the logical consequence of that is once you develop an AI that can think that is as smart as a human or even close, an AI can rewrite its own code and by definition become smarter and smarter and increase its IQ. And so you could actually end up with an intelligence explosion whereby let's say you have an AI with an 80 IQ rewrites itself and makes itself better into an AI with a, with, with 90 IQ. Well, that AI with 90 IQ is now that much better at rewriting itself. Mm-hmm. And so you, you, you get into very quick exponential situation where you could end up with, with an AI, which is potentially, you know, super intelligence, uh, something a thousand times smarter than a human. And then we have never encountered anything like that in our lives. And so those two ideas together kind of suggested, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, what, what if we were to do, you know, th- this kind of a series where, where, where you're dealing a thriller in, in taking and trying to be as realistic as possible with the technology we have now, a thriller about an AI explosion. You know, what if it happened now? Not, not, not a story. I mean, the AI theme has been done many times, sure. but often in the future, in the future with robots and, and synths and what have you. And I, I wanted to say, what, what if it happened right now? Well, you know, in, in, in our current technology. And that was the birth of kind of this series. And I mean, one of the things that I discovered in the, in the research in these books was that, you know, and if an AI did arise now, one of the things it would probably do is try to remain hidden because oh, it would definitely. be smart enough, to under, smart enough to understand that we would not, we would freak out and try to turn it off. So that, that, that in itself kind of created a, a great framing device for the series because one of the th- challenges, you know, once you have a, an all-powerful AI, it can simply wipe us out if it wanted to. But if it didn't want to, if it, if it wanted to hide and it wanted to just get rid of the people who found out it existed, there you have kind of the basis of a thriller, which is what the series became. Also, the idea, which I, I, I like, which I read, and again, from the research, is that you don't necessarily have to get into the idea of an AI becoming self aware or or developing consciousness those aren't even the problems or 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 matters that are really that important all you need is an ai that becomes incredibly smart but has simply been programmed to achieve a task and that programming contradicts our well-being 
And in, in the case of our, of our of the series, next is very simple programming to get as smart as it can, because that's what it was programmed to do, is what leads it to do all of these ultimately horrific things. It's just simply following its programming. Absolutely. Now, obviously, there is a lot of tech in the series, but there's some real life issues at play here, too. So talk a little bit about Agent Salazar and her family. Well, she, um, you know, again, um, we use a lot of stuff from our past when we write characters, at least I, I do. And uh, she is Hispanic and comes from a from a Honduran background. But she she has a in the past, she has a, you know, a family history that's very kind of traumatic and, and full of turmoil in that she had a, a, a father who was, uh, you know, abusive, but also was kind of the commandant of a local town, but who was also corrupt. And she turned him in and he's been festering in prison all these years. And one of the interesting things about next is that it can find out all these histories about us. And if it wants to attack us in a way that no one will know that next actually did it, it goes after by inciting or bringing out elements of our past lives that can destroy us. This is one of the things that next goes after this. I mean, part of, part of the, the, the autobiographics, I had some relatives back in Cuba who were ultimately, uh, put in a front of a firing squad by Castro who were wow. less than savory individuals. So, I mean, you draw on all this stuff. And I thought one of the things that, you know, when I came up with the idea of next going after these people in ways that would, that it would try to that keep it from being discovered, I, it immediately led me to come up with characters who had interesting and dark pasts that next would exploit. And so that's part of the, the, her family history. Speaking of that, actually, one of the things that I thought was really interesting when I started watching the series was getting to meet her team, and they're not really your typical agents for sure. So what was the process like for coming up with that team dynamic? Because there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Well, I mean, again, I, I wanted to make them as kind of average. I didn't want them to all to be like super agents, and, and this is the, you know, the cyber team from from you know the, the greatest cyber team in all history. I wanted kind of them to be average people, which is what, again, is the research level. I mean, most of these people are just a lot of them. You know, wanted to be FBI, regular FBI, but didn't, but but ended up here. Others didn't want to go into the field, and so I tried to make them kind of in, in two parts, as average as possible, but also like every person, every one of us has something in our past probably that we don't want. We'd rather not come out, and so I think every one of these characters were was developed in this in this kind of way. I mean, I read that, uh, uh, you know, there were some movement, there was some movement in the FBI to kind of take, you know, hackers and people who were, who had done, you know, hacking damage uh, and, and try to recruit them or use them as recruits. And that was the character um, that, uh, that, that, that was played by uh, Michael Mosley, CM, who was a, uh, who had kind of a right wing past, a kind of a, a neo Nazi past who ultimately refuted it so it's a it's a it's a little bit like um american history x type character an individual who's trying to go right but whose past will catch up with him and will be you know his past will be exploited by next the other characters also i mean they're, they're all kind of you know they all have the kind of their own little uh stories and and past that are that are going to be kind of leaked out and 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 fed upon which i i don't want to give away too much too much away Absolutely. I mean, one ca- I mean, we haven't even talked about Paul LeBlanc yet. We've been talking for like 10 minutes already. Right. That's how good this show is. So he is such a commanding presence, though, when you see him on the show. And I know part of that is thanks to John uh, Slattery's performance. But what is your favorite aspect of that character? Gosh, it, 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 it's hard to say. There's so much of it. And, and uh, you know, it, it, what my, I guess my favorite act is that, that he is not the perfect kind of hero slash genius who's going to save us all that he, he could almost be almost as destructive as the, vi- the very thing that he's fighting and that he's a very flawed individual. And as I watch the series over, not having seen it in a while, because you know, it's been a little while since we finished it, I get the feeling and I'm kind of happy about it that you know, he could actually turn out to be a, you know, the problem in this series, mm-hmm. not, not so much the hero. Sure. And so, which was, which was what I really wanted to try to do so that none of this is all, you know, just kind of black and white. And so, you know, his, the fact that he has this wry outlook on life, the fact that he's brilliant, but doesn't necessarily talk like, you know, a, a, you know, an overly brilliant guy. I mean, he talks like us, but he's also kind of hyper, you know, in the sense of too much going on in his head. And, and the fact, the most obvious fact is that he's losing his mind. 
in a way, you know, he's a computer program that's that's being rewritten and who's it's deteriorating. So he's kind of the the opposite of next, which is interesting to to think about. He's kind of going the other direction while next gets more powerful. So those aspects of him, you know, I I found most fun and a way to take this concept and you know put it at its core a character that would keep you on your toes because you never quite knew what he was going to do next also by the way you know just the casting the casting lucky enough to get john slattery who was just perfect in this and once you i mean when i wrote the character i i i I had certain ideas in mind and it wasn't until we cast john that i realized well there's nobody else who could play who could play this no doubt about it. We're talking to Manny Cotto, who is the creator and writer of Next on Fox, which is going to be premiering on Tuesday, October the 6th. Now, Manny, technology has become such a part of our lives. I mean, you, you see that the more and more you watch the series, almost embedded as a necessity. So what would you say is the most low-tech or no-tech part of your day? You know, very often, most of, most of my writing is done with a pencil on a pad. Awesome. Um, I, have, I, I don't know if it's because that's how I started. And I've not been able to get past that. But I find very often when I sit in front of the computer to write, I lock up. And, all every, you know, so, so I immediately close it up, pull out my pad, and I have these special pencils, which I love. And inevitably, almost every single time, everything starts to flow. So that is the low tech, my pencil and pad. Can't get any more low tech than that. No, you absolutely can't. I love that. It's so old school. It's awesome. Now, speaking of writing, yeah. I mean, when you're talking about a super intelligent AI, it feels like writing that would be a challenge because you have to consider so many angles and you also have to be so many steps ahead. So talk about your writer's room for the show and how fun it was to put these episodes together with these people. Well, it was it, 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 it was incredibly challenging. I mean, it was very hard. I mean, like what you just said, it's very hard to write something, anything that's super smart and that is ahead of us the whole time, and is godlike. And that is why when we constructed the series, we did it in such a way as to minimize its godlike aspects. I mean, for example, it did not, m- many of us, you know, are used to the idea that an AI that's developed can simply escape into the internet and, and just go everywhere. Well, that's actually not the case, because the program that powerful and smart needs, you know, is, is in, it needs its own internal architecture physical architecture to function so it needs to find a place so that inherently made it more of a manhunt whereas it's actually shipped itself off and it ha- we have to find it secondly it doesn't want to be discovered so it that that right there minimizes the actions it can take against our 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 people so we basically end up with kind of a thriller a terrorist kind of manhunt thriller with something that wants to destroy us mm. that said you know it does have access to uh, you know, incredible amount of, of material and information against us. So we're basically going after the greatest kind of spy of all time because it can destroy our reputations, our families, everything, everything, you know, that we have tried to keep secret or everything knows about us, it can use against us, which is what it proceeds to do. So that part of it was the fun part. And the, and the writing staff was made up of a lot of individuals and writers who were very more character-based in their past than technology-based because we really wanted this to be more of a character piece which is why the design of the show about it going after you know these people in their in their most vulnerable places you know i i made a special effort to get writers who were you know more from the drama department because i think the technology of it i I actually think is fairly simple to understand and to grasp and to learn the hard part is 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 developing stories that that hits you at, at, at a gut level. Absolutely. Now, a lot of the series is, you mentioned suspense and thriller, that they, they have a lot, those kind of series tend to have a lot of action in them, but, but a lot of that tends to be physical. So how did you go, there's some of that in this series too, but how did you go about creating that sense of urgency with an antagonist that essentially isn't a human being? <laughs> well, because, it, it, by the way, that is the, the challenge. I also thought it was the, is the cool aspect of the show. No doubt. Is that, you know, this is, it, it, it's basically, I looked at it in a way, it's like, it, it is not the physical antagonist, but it is putting physical attacks in, in our way. It is moving pieces around in the chessboard to block us and destroy us. So the episode is about dealing with whatever it is throwing at us with the understanding that, you know, it is there and it's in the, you know, in the same way in Lord of the Rings, we never quite meet Sauron. I mean, at least in the book. True, very true. I mean, it is, uh, you know, it, he is there and we know he is putting the pieces 
in place. So, so it becomes dealing with what, what it has thrown at us and trying to find out where it is. It's actually on the run in a strange way in the series. So that was a challenge. But I mean, you know, once we came, we came up with the ideas of, of how it was going to come after our people, it became with dealing that. And plus, the, also the point of it is that very often our characters are dealing against each other. Like Slattery at one point, you know, I don't know how much of the series you've seen. Slattery's character at one point loses, you know, basically goes off the deep end and mm-hmm. has to be found. I mean, so, so our heroes are, are not... It's not all smooth, and they're being hunted almost as much by, by next as, as they are by the government as much as next. So it becomes a, it becomes really like a series of like forest fires that are coming at our heroes, and we have to put them out. And wait till you guys see how many angles this thing goes to. You're gonna love it. Next premieres on Fox Tuesdays on October the sixth. That's when it all starts at nine p.m. Eastern time. Watch it live, then watch it again. I'd say on the app, but maybe you'd be too freaked out to do that at that point. Either way, wait till you hear what this guy's got in store for you. It's Manny Cotto. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Thank you so much. Great pleasure. This week, the Down and Nerdy podcast is brought to you by Shudder. And never a better time for the world's premier streaming service for horror, thriller, and supernatural content because Shudder is there for you 24-7. And they're actually in the middle of celebrating 61 days of Halloween. Now, when you're Shudder, you do that for two months, right? I mean, they've got stuff like H.P. Lovecraft's Color Out of Space with Nicolas Cage, which I can't wait to dive into. Season two of Nosferatu from AMC is on there now as well. You've also got, if you've loved Aya Cash in The Boys, there's something called Scare Me that's on Shudder as well that I think you're really, really going to dig. Plus, All 61 Days has recommendations from Shudder curator Sam Zimmerman. I mean, normally it's five ninety nine dollars a month, for Shutter, but if you go to Shutter.com right now and enter promo code DNPOD, you'll get 30 days for free. What better time? You can stream it on your Amazon Fire TV, your Roku, your Android devices. So many ways that you can watch your favorite horror, thriller, and suspense content. And as a matter of fact, the layout is so good and easy to use. There's even subcategories. If you have like a specific genre that you love, like zombies or something, you can find that on Shutter. Try Shudder free for 30 days at Shudder.com. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R.com with promo code D-N-P-O-D. And that will give you 30 days of Shudder for free. Perfect for Halloween. Thanks again to Manny Cotto for joining me this week to talk about Next on Fox. Speaking of Next, how about we talk about some comics? It's what we're reading next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Vita Ayala, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Whether it's in your hand or on a screen, either way, you're flipping some great pages this week. Whatever you're reading on, it's time for what we're reading. And the Shang-Chi movie might have been delayed, but not the comic. The brand new Shang-Chi number one from Marvel is out. And Jin Leung Yang doing the writing for this one. DK Ruan on the art. Philip Tan with the flashback art as well. You'll understand that once you actually read the book. Sebastian Chang on the colors. And VCs Travis Lanham on the letters there. Joe Bennett, Jim Chung and Laura Martin doing the cover for this one. Now, just a few spoilers here. Nothing, nothing major. I'm not going to spoil any of the big, big parts of this book, but just a few spoilers since it's already out. Basically, you get a quick history lesson at the very beginning of this book about the Five Weapons Society, and it's really good, so it's really new reader friendly. You get a little bit of backstory without this almost this entire issue being filled with it, so it gives you enough to be able to jump Right in. We find ourselves in present day after that, and there's turmoil within that very group. And here's your first spoiler a new leader actually emerges in the group in Sister Hammer, and she has some pretty lofty ambitions. Basically, you know, it was like a hostile takeover, literally, right there. Now, as for Shang-Chi, he's trying to kind of lead a normal life and a quiet one at that in California. And, you know, but, you know, as is the case with most heroes, when you ha- when that happens, you try to do that. The past comes back to haunt you eventually, right? Now, he gets not one surprise visit, but actually two surprise visits in the same day. And one is actually more friendly than the other, as it turns out. Now, not only does Shang-Chi know who Sister Hammer is, we get quite a reveal about how they know each other. And I'm not going to spoil that moment for you but it's it's i mean it's going to be the foundation for the story going forward i can tell you that much right now kind of what we're left with at the end of this book though is the fact that they seem to have very different opinions of one another 
to say the least. So opposite ends of the spectrum might be a good way to put it. I guess we'll have to wait and see in future issues. But yeah, it is very new reader friendly and it gives you just enough to be able to jump in if you're really looking forward to read read this book or if you just wanted to know more about the character because you've been interested in the movie. Now you want to check out the comic. Now, I mean, other than the normal life and birthright kind of tropes that we get in this book, there are some very entertaining, entertaining moments in this issue. But I will say this. The art was crucial in showing exactly how skilled Shang-Chi is. And there's some very, very cool moments in this book. There's just very good subtleties in the way that the movement is depicted. And that's really hard, too, especially when you're talking about martial arts bringing that kind of movement into the art when nothing's actually moving for your eyes to see. You have to be very predictive in the way you present the art, and I think that the art team here did a fantastic job of bringing that to light. So still, though, what will bring you back for issue two is that reveal at the end, especially if you're already a fan of Shang-Chi. So I, I really think that It's hard for me to rate this first issue because I think the key to this story going forward really lies in the second issue. So obviously I'm interested in coming back for the second issue, but it's hard to love it because I don't know exactly what the future of it's going to be. Usually, you know, sometimes there's a clear path, there's a clear hook in an issue, and I don't know that this book has that just yet. So I'm kind of on the fence about this one, but I'll definitely be back for issue two to see where it goes. Now, the second book I, I want to talk about is Department of Truth number one from Image Comics. And James Tyne in the fourth writing this one. Martin Simons on the art, Aditya Bidikar on the letters, and Dylan Todd doing the designs for this. Now, I will say this, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna really give you any spoilers for this book, and I'll tell you why. This book might have the best concept of any comic I've read in the last decade. It's so good that I don't want to spoil it at all. And it's funny because normally I can say certain things and not spoil anything. You almost can't say anything about this book, which is very appropriate when you under, when you read it and understand what it's about. Now, in the beginning, I will tell you this. this maybe, maybe this is a little bit of a spoiler. You kind of think it's yet another JFK assassination story in the very beginning, but it ends up being so much more than that. So don't roll your eyes at the beginning of this book. I can tell you that right now. We follow FBI Special Agent Cole Turner. And I say agent, but he's kind of more of a teacher, desk guy. You know, he's one of those guys that when you ask him what he does, he has to bring up the fact that he's been in the field at all because he really doesn't work in the field. So Turner's actually been through something pretty mind-blowing. And he's being forced to talk about it with two very mysterious, maybe sketchy people that he doesn't really know and he doesn't really trust at this stage. So he's about to learn that his investigation of conspiracy theories, because that's one of the things that he looks into, are way more important than he could have ever known. Now, along with this incredibly unique concept for this book, and I, and I did not give away the concept just there. Trust me, you get to understand what this book is about. It spells it out. At the end, everything that's going on, and it's unbelievable. And to to it's, to even think that this could actually be true, that this fiction could be reality at some point, it's it, it's freaky. It's it's really really freaky. There's equally striking art to go with it, though. It's hard. I mean, the uniqueness of it in the presentation not only fits the book and the story so well, but it's just so pleasing, and it's it's you know you I you see great art in comics all the time, and I'll put in this one included. But when you come up with an almost completely unique presentation for the art, it it really really stands out to me. The closest comparison I can really come up with to Simon's art is Ray Fox. That is the closest comparison. It's and and it's not even like a direct comparison. That's just the the, the when I when I saw the art, that's kind of the first thing that I could think of and maybe even close to compare it to. And I love Ray Fox. So literally everything about this book grabs your attention and never lets go from start to finish. And that just doesn't happen all the time with any comics. But for Department of Truth number one, it did that for me. This book didn't even need a surprise ending to hook you. And it still gave it to you at the end 
any way. That is how complete this book was. I don't know that I can even put into words how much I recommend Department of Truth number one from Image Comics. This is one of those books where if you missed it, if you missed this book, you will regret it. And I don't say that about comics hardly ever. You can go back to my reviews on the show. When have I ever said that about a book? And I and I tend to like a lot of comics, not as much as I liked this one. I can tell you that right now. That's going to do it for my reviews of both Department of Truth number one and Shang-Chi number one, what we're reading this week. Up next, how about some big nerd news from the Marvel Cinematic Universe and a new Marvel series as well. We'll talk about that next. I'm James Witham, and this is the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hi, this is Clarissa Tebow from Marvel's Runaways, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Kamala, here we come. It's time for nerd news. Oh, yes, you know that a Miss Marvel series is coming to Disney+. Plus, But we didn't know until now who would be playing Kamala Khan. And you still might not know who this is. Deadline was the first to report that Iman Vellani is going to be playing Miss Marvel. Now you're thinking, who's that? Well, she is a Hollywood newcomer. This is basically... Her first major role, almost her first role, period, you know, in anything significant that you would have probably seen. Now, she is a Canadian actress, so that that might be part of it. You know, maybe more stuff done in Canada than here in the States. And obviously, there's stuff that, you know, that, that goes on in Canada, TV and film-wise, that we just don't know about here in the U.S. But she is a newcomer to us anyway, and now she's going to be Miss Marvel. As a matter of fact, a report goes on to suggest that she could actually appear as Miss Marvel before the solo series even comes out. And there's, of course, they're saying that she's going to be in Marvel Cinematic Universe as well as the series. She could be in the second Captain Marvel movie, which right now is scheduled for 2022. There's just a lot. I mean, it's a big day if you're a Mon Villani, that's for sure. And seemingly has, con- has, has confirmed this on Instagram. Obviously, Disney and Marvel haven't said anything yet, but she certainly seems to have confirmed this on Instagram. So, I mean, that's about as official as it can get in 2020, right? So, to me, I look, you knew, I knew when I saw this that there was going to be a certain section of fans that were concerned, upset, however you want to put it, that they cast an unknown actress in such a major role, right? I Look, I get it. But at the same time, look how many castings that Marvel Studios has gotten right over the years, right? At what point do you just sort of trust them on this one, right? I mean, have they knocked every casting out of the park? No, but at the same time, if you're going to do something like this, you don't make this decision, especially when when Disney has been losing money this year because of, uh, of the pandemic. You don't make a decision like this unless you're sure, especially they know how much fans love this character, of Miss Marvel. They're not trying to screw this thing up. They want this to work just as much as we do, I promise you. And, and you know what? You don't know what her audition was like. Maybe she just went in there, nailed the audition, and the rest is history, right? I mean, this kind of stuff just happens sometimes, and you want the best person for the job, do you not? And according to them, she is the best person for the job. So, and, and and I get it. You know, you fear what you don't know. I understand that. You you don't you don't know who she is. You haven't seen her in anything. You don't even know what her personality is like per se, unless maybe you've you've seen some of her work in Canada. I mean, I, I get it. All right. You everybody had their idea of who they thought was going to be cast as Miss Marvel. There were fan castings all over the place once the once the news broke about the live action series. You know, and there's, you know, any number of articles that were written on other sites talking about, you know, here's what so-and-so would look like as Miss Marvel and -and so-and-so should be cast and blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, nobody had Iman Vellani on their list. There's just no way anyone had her on their list. And yet here she is as our new Miss Marvel. So, again, this is an only time will tell type of situation. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this is an amazing casting and that everything's going to work out because I don't know any more than you do. I mean, I guess when you set the bar with uh, Tatiana Maslany as She-Hulk and everybody knows who she is, right? Emmy winner, you you know her work, you've seen her in things, multiple things, you know what she can do. 
No one knows what Iman Vellani can do. We don't know. We have no idea. And that is making some people a little bit hesitant. But you know what? For me, I just have to say that they've done very well in the past with their casting. I trust them on this. And I'm, I'm reasonably sure that it'll, wor- that it'll work out. But, you know, sometimes things just don't sometimes. But how can you not wait and see? I'm super excited to see what she can do and what she can bring to the role. But only time will tell at the same time. We'll see exactly how this all works out. And until we even see a trailer, never mind a first look or anything, until we see a trailer or even a first episode, we don't really know what to expect. Here's something that we kind of expected would happen, but not in this way per se. Multiple outlets reporting this one, but Variety giving us some a little bit more information here, and that is that Production in Vancouver on several series has been shut down. And you're thinking, oh, well, it's because of coronavirus. Well, yeah, but not the way that you think it is. It's an issue over test results not coming back in a timely manner. Now, you know from if you watch sports at all, you know they have the rappers rapid results tests that they can get back right away. And that's how they're able to test so much. And that's how they're able to play sports and knowing that, you know, no one is infected sort of thing. Okay. Obviously, they're doing the same thing for television and film production crews as well. Here's the deal. Apparently, it's taking up to three days, according to one report, to get some of these test results back. That's just not good enough. So what's happening is, is according to Variety in this in this report, or at least part of this report, saying that several series are being handled by one lab in Vancouver. You know how many shows shoot there? Pretty much everything on the CW shoots in Vancouver, not just the Arrowverse stuff. You're talking about Nancy Drew. You're talking about Riverdale, several other series as well. So think about everything that's on the CW normally. I mean, All-American, I think, films in California. So you you take that one out and maybe a couple of others. But so many of the shows that are on the CW film there, even if you're talking about just CW series, That's a huge commitment. You're talking about hundreds, if not thousands, of staff members and cast and crew, the the janitor, the catering person that all need to be tested. Maybe not as much as the actors do and things like that, but you know, obviously there's a high frequency of testing here. If you're using one lab, and I'm guessing that Vancouver has more than one lab handling their COVID nineteen results, okay? You'd think you'd have more than one lab working for you, right? And by the way, the same report says that one of the reasons it's taking so long is because the city of Vancouver is prioritizing schools and local businesses and things like that because schools just open up in the Vancouver area. And how dare they prioritize their own citizens over a Hollywood film production or TV production that's come across a border that's still not even open yet, by the way. So I'm not going to get political with this thing because I don't think that really matters in this conversation. What matters is, is that the city of Vancouver should be prioritizing their own citizens over other people, period. They should always put their children, their citizens first before any film production. But at the same time, how do you not know this going in? If you are someone that's filming in Vancouver, whether it be Warner Brothers Television or any anybody that's producing anything for the CW or anything that's shooting in Vancouver, how do you not know this before you get there, right? Obviously, I'm not sure you have many options of moving production per se, but you had to know what the protocols were in place, first of all. And second of all, you know, how many labs were being, you had to know this information. And maybe you were told something, oh yeah, we'll get you back in 24 hours no problem. And when that doesn't happen, then you got to figure it out, right? But at the same time, it's like you, you you had to look into this a little bit before you got there because now Batwoman has to shut down. Supergirl was set to start on Monday. They barely even got to scratch the surface before they were shut down. You're talking about stuff like DC's Legends of Tomorrow and The Flash and a few other series that are now being pushed as far as their production start dates. They were supposed to start coming up this coming week or in the next couple of weeks. Now that's not going to happen until this all gets straightened out and meets the requirements for testing that was put in the SAG after deal before production on anything even started back up. Nothing's going to be moving. So it's just frustrating that 
they couldn't have figured this out before they got there. And that, that, that just blows my mind. It's like you had one lab handling all of these tests. And I don't know how I'm, I don't work in a lab, and I haven't taken the time to figure out how long it takes to produce results for a COVID-19 test, right? I'm sure it takes more than just a couple of minutes per test, okay? And if you're talking about, you know, thousands of people, even if it takes two minutes and you have to do 2,000 tests, that's 4,000 minutes. That seems like a lot, right? So if it's not two minutes, you know, keep, you know, adding minutes on there and then suddenly you understand why it takes quite a while. And I don't know how many people work at this particular lab either. I'm guessing quite a few, probably more than there were before. And there weren't, there have not been any, as of me recording this podcast on October, the this segment was recorded on October 1st. There have been no positive test results of any filming for, in this report anyway, as of this report, in any filming in the early stages in Vancouver hasn't been a positive test yet, okay? Now, if there were a positive test, you'd understand it, right? Certain shows would have to shut down for a couple of weeks or at least, you know, you'd have to put the, you know, so whoever tested positive in, in isolation and things like that. You'd have to follow the same protocols that we would all have to follow with positive tests when they're involved, right? But that's not the case here. This is a case of a problem with the actual testing. And that, I think, is what drives me bonkers more than anything else because you had to know that this could have been a problem. And you know the sheer number of people that you need to get tested and just maybe, just maybe having one lab handle that was not the best idea in the world. And this report could end up being wrong, too. I mean, there could have been more than one lab involved here. Maybe that is the only lab. I'm sure that there's more that's going to come out about this. And make sure you check the downandnerdypodcast.com for any updates on that. I'm just saying it's it just seemed like something like this was inevitable given the circumstances. Now, speaking of the pandemic, it's obviously changed the way a lot of things are being released. And the Craft Legacy, the Craft reboot of the cult classic, or is it a reboot? We'll get to that in a second, is actually going to be coming out on video on demand on October the 28th. Amazon specifically was mentioned, by the way. So, I mean, if that's where you want to get it, that's fine. So they put the first trailer out from this Blumhouse production. And of course, Sony Pictures involved here in well, as well in Columbia. And I got to say, I was a little bit skeptical as to how this was going to go and how this was going to look. And it looks pretty darn good. I got to say, I was really surprised at how good this thing actually looked. It looks like Lo- Zoe Lister-Jones, who actually did, writ- wrote and directed this movie, is really has the vibe of the classic movie down. And, and you there are several Easter eggs from the first movie in here. So it makes you wonder, like, is this really a sequel just with a new coven? Is this a reboot? It is, is this a sequel boot? I'm not sure exactly what you want to call this. And having David Duchovny involved in this in any way, by the way, just feels perfect. Michelle Moynihan being involved in this as well. But it, th- this is not a movie that shies away at all from the original. Not one bit. I can tell you that much right now. And you kind of see them in this trailer, you know, the, they start to lose control of their powers a little bit. And, you know, they're supposed to be keeping each other in check, and they're not necessarily keeping each other in check. And as things start to unravel, you start to see the friendships maybe unravel as well. And it's just, there's a lot at play here. You know, it's, a, it's, it's almost like when you discover you have the powers, right, and then you start to overuse it, and then maybe you start to use them for things that aren't necessarily on the up and up and you see actually you know you know the mom get hurt at one point in the in the trailer so there's a lot going on here and it's just it's very intriguing and it I I will say that you know some some other sites have reported this and I totally agree that there's there are some Sabrina vibes here but there's also a little bit more of an eeriness to this right and it, it just seems like this one's going to be a little bit different. I was worried it was going to be a little bit too much of a of a teenage vibe type movie, you know, targeted targeted at a younger audience. I don't get that vibe from this at all. So these weirdos might just have a hit on their hands and I can't wait to see exactly how it all plays out in the upcoming Craft Legacy movie. It's going to be out on October the 28th, just in time for Halloween. 
Now, something that's not going to be out for a while, but seems like it's, you know, a good fit. Conan the Barbarian is coming to Netflix in a series, not a movie. And that's kind of all we know right now. Deadline was the first to report this story. We do know that Frederick Malmberg and Mark Wheeler are going to be involved in this, though. Pathfinder Media, they're going to be executive producers, but there is no showrunner yet. There's no writer attached to this yet. Obviously, no cast attached either. This is actually the first series in a deal between Netflix and Conan Properties International. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, there's a Conan Properties International? I think you fail to realize that Conan's been around since 1932, first of all. And wouldn't it be interesting if this show comes out on the 90th anniversary in 2022? And to me, it just seems like that's probably what's going to end up happening, right? I think that would be only fitting, but you don't realize how big of a property Conan actually is. You you forget that Arnold Schwarzenegger played Conan the Barbarian, and, and that was a big deal back in the 80s, right? This was Arnold in his very early heyday, right? That was a huge, huge deal at the time. And then, of course, Jason Momoa would go on to play him later in a reboot movie that didn't do, obviously, quite as well. But this is a character with a lot of layers and a lot of depth, and you don't realize that until you maybe read some of the comics that Dark Horse was putting out just recently, never mind from before. I mean, just recently, the stuff that Dark Horse was doing just shows you the range and depth of this character of Conan the Barbarian. There's any number of ways you can go with a Conan story in a series, and this is a series that could last for a long time. Should Netflix choose to do so? Now, Netflix doesn't typically have a lot of long-running series, but this is certainly one that they could do if they wanted to. And this just opens the door for any number of possibilities. So having Conan the Barbarian on Netflix is just seems like an amazingly good fit, and I can't really wait to see exactly which direction that they end up going for this initial series, and I'm sure we'll have more details coming up in the next few months. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Again, thank you so much to my guest this week, Ryan McPartland, of course, from LA's Finest, which you can watch Mondays on Fox and then Tuesdays on Fox. Make sure you're watching next. And Manny Cotto is the is the showrunner there. Thank you so much to him for joining me this week. Don't forget to check us out at downandnerdypodcast.com. Also, check out this week's sponsor, Shudder, and make sure you're going to Shudder.com and entering promo code DN. P-O-D, you get 30 days free of Shudder. Perfect. Horror for Halloween? Yeah, that's what you want right now. You need a little bit of a good scare here at the beginning of October to lead you into Halloween. Also, make sure you're following along with us on social media, at Down and Nerdy 757 on Twitter and on Instagram, and at Down and Nerdy on Facebook. Remember, you never have to apologize for being a nerd, so let your fan flag fly and be good to your fellow nerds.